Scotland's First Minister goes on the charm offensive to try to stay in the EU. But can the Scots remain when Britain leaves? And a week after Brexit, how are the minorities dealing with this backlash? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, it's no secret that Britain is a divided nation in the wake of a vote to leave the EU. Scotland, Northern Ireland and London all voted overwhelmingly to remain. And now the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, she's trying to make sure that Scotland's voice is heard. The leader of the Scottish National Party travelled to Brussels for talks with senior EU officials. She's begun pushing for Scots to be able to keep their EU membership after Britain leaves. Well, it's not just Scotland. Northern Ireland also voted to remain and made sure that its voice was heard this week. If English votes drag us out of the EU, that would be like... Britannia waves the rules. There was a democratic vote. We voted to remain. I tell you that the last thing that the people of Ireland need is an EU border with 27 member states stuck right in the middle of it. OK, let's introduce our guests now. Joining us from Lancaster in the UK, Mark Garnett, who's Senior Lecturer in Politics at Lancaster University. In Barcelona, in Spain, Sunny Hundal, journalist and editor of the political blog, Liberal Conspiracy. And in Toulouse, in France, Susie Denison, Director of the European Power Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome to you all. Susie, can I start with you? Because of your uh, specific knowledge of the workings of the EU, do the Scots, uh, do the Northern Irish and London, should they declare that they want it, do they have a chance of maintaining some kind of special link with the European Union not being part of a sovereign state, the United Kingdom? Um, hello there, and th thank you for having me on the show. Well, I, I think, firstly, um, uh, we should be clear that um, th this needs to be resolved on the UK side before it can be worked through on the EU side. There have been positive noises um, from from EU leaders and the European Parliament about the possibility of, of keeping Scotland in, if that's the choice that they want to make. But the, but French, the position sorry, that sorry, Susie, but the French and the, the Spanish leaders came out pretty soon after Nicola Sturgeon... Uh, made her way to Brussels to say, no way, we're not dealing with, with Scotland as a, as a separate entity. Well, well, clearly the um, clearly the way that other member states see it um, plays out in terms of uh, certain regional issues that they have at home. And I'm sure our colleague who's speaking from Barcelona can speak more about the sort of the Catalan issue um, there in Spain. Um, but uh, the um, uh, the German leadership and um, and also in the debate in the European Parliament um, uh, earlier th this week have have, have both um, made clear that um, they want to find a solution um, on this which accommodates both sides. But what I was going to say is that what we have had um, in terms of the vote on UK membership of the EU um, and the strong vote to remain from Scotland um, and Northern Ireland is not the same as a vote on whether or not they want to leave the UK um, if the UK is, um, is, is not part of the EU. And I think that there would have to be clarity on that particular point, um, uh, either by process of referendum or through constitutional discussions in the UK first before a serious debate could be had about this at EU level. And so, Sunny, you are in, in uh, Barcelona um, and perhaps then can shed a little bit of light on the Spanish, on the Spanish position on this. We know that uh, uh, Mariano Rajoy, who was quite categoric in, the, in uh, beating down any aspirations of Nicola Sturgeon on the matter, uh, we know that he's got his own problems at home, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. So, actually, Brexit had a big impact on the Spanish elections too because... Mr. Rajoy actually used the fact that the Brexit had happened to say, look, you know, these people uh, are adding instability, could an add instability to the European Union, to your lives. You know, is that the kind of result you want? Do you really want secession? Do you really want 
to bring someone in who is going to create more instability, pointing towards Podemos, the left-wing organization, as well as other smaller right-wing um, political parties. So the politics matters a lot more here than the actual regulations of the EU, because what will happen is the Spanish have said no to Scotland because what they don't want are places like Catalonia here in Barcelona to say to the European Union, yes, we also want to do the same. We also want to talk to you about European Union accession before we even get independence. And so they, so they will put a stop to that. And as a result, what will happen is Scotland is not likely to get anywhere with discussions about being a member of the EU until and unless it has a proper referendum and actually leaves the UK. And that, I suspect, the British government, the Tories certainly, will want to avoid as much as possible. So I suspect what they'll do is try and do a, a fudge for years and years until the <laughs> issue dies down. All right, so all right. Well, let's, let's put that... That's a very interesting point, Sonny. Let's put that point to Mark. And um, I was actually going to ask you, Mark, what will happen, what do you think will happen to this a democratic expression of the people of Scotland, of the people of Northern Ireland, of the people of London, for that matter? What will happen to it if democracy is to be respected in its purest form? Well, uh, there's been a concerted effort by the British government to uh, give the impression that somehow the vote, the Brexit vote, was a decisive vote. Well, it was anything but a decisive vote. And the fact that Northern Ireland and Scotland and London were all uh, in favour of remaining, actually, once the passion begins to die away a little bit from all this, it will be possible for a, a, a pragmatic, unifying-type politician to say that the fact that Scotland, that, uh, that the United Kingdom is in danger of breaking up because of this very narrow vote, uh, that's going to add, I think, ammunition to the cause of people who, in some way, one way or another, want the vote to be either nullified by events or set aside completely. After all, this was not a binding referendum, as I think a lot of people voted in the referendum thought that immediately the vote was taken, Britain would leave the European Union. And now they realise that this is anything but the case. I think that if the referendum was held today, it would be a different result. And so the Scottish factor, I think, plays into all that and makes uh, brings doubt into a, a, just such a narrowly contested vote and ammunition for those who would like to see some kind kind of a, a revisitation of this vote. So can you see, realistically then, Mark, uh, Scotland deciding to have a rerun on the referendum for independence from the United Kingdom as being the next step? Well, it was said at the time, and quite rightly, I think so, that if there was a, a, a significant change in the circumstances of the United Kingdom, that that could be the trigger for a, a new vote on independence. However, uh, I think that the economic prospects of an independent Scotland are even more uh, dubious than they were when the first referendum was called. The price of oil is still hovering around $50 a bar barrel. That kind of thing, I think, again, makes it more difficult for the pro-independence people to make their case with any confidence. Nicola Sturgeon is an extremely pragmatic and careful politician. She won't call this referendum, like Mr Cameron, who called a referendum without knowing for sure what the result would be. Uh, Mrs Sturgeon is definitely going to be uh, wanting clear evidence and opinion polls before she calls that referendum and uh, at the moment that doesn't uh, that isn't the case at all so really what she's doing at the moment it seems is at least make putting her cards on the table with uh, other EU members feeling the temperature finding out making it clear they know that they're serious about staying within the EU in some way uh, and then we're going to have to await further events uh, to see whether she can make progress with the independence agenda and Sunny in Barcelona is that something you agree with? I mean, part of it, but uh, okay, well, let's put it this way. I agree with the point about Scotland and the fact that Nicola Sturgeon is going to delay the, the vote, but I don't agree with this idea that somehow uh, we can revisit the referendum. The, the, the right wing press is not going to allow it, a lot of the Conservative Party is not going to allow it, and certainly Conservative voters are not going to allow it. It is almost certainly the case that we're going to come out. It's just a matter of how long it'll take. It's a matter of how, what, what kind of process that takes um, and, and, and the details. But the fact of the matter is there is a lot of conservative MPs who want to leave the European Union. And every time we have to pay them money 
or every time there's immigration figures come up and people say, well, why are there so many immigrants still coming into the UK? Then it will, people will say, well, why haven't we left the European Union yet? So the, the referendum may have been close, but it, it's a done decision. And there's no way the MPs are going to go back on it. They, they, uh, there's no well, way they can all right. say, well, well that's, let, you know, let's Let's put that. Let's put that to Susie in Toulouse because I'm not entirely sure that that's the case. Susie, do you agree with Sonny that now it's a done deal? Uh, that uh, Article 50, at some point, uh, by some uh, prime minister, uh, will eventually put, be put into place, and that the the unraveling of the relationship between the United Kingdom and the EU will begin officially. Well, yes, I do agree with Sunny, um, but um, but I also agree with the other point of view that Mark put across too. Look, I think that it's a done deal now, um, and I think that um, those who voted for Remain um, should all accept um, that that um, leave is the direction um, that we are moving in. That yes, um, Article Fifty um, will be invoked at some point, and certainly the message is coming very strongly from the summit meeting which happened in Brussels earlier this week that other EU leaders want to see that happen as soon as possible to to contain the damage which Brexit has done to the rest of the EU. But at the same time, I think there are two potential trigger points coming up in the future uh, which, which could change, um, change things. Um, firstly, I think it's very likely that um, there will be a general election in the UK um, in the coming months. Um, uh, and uh, at that point, um, it will in, in effect be a, a sort of a second referendum. Um, do people trust, um, uh, as we hear, have, uh, do, whoever is elected as the new Conservative leader, um, uh, whether that's um, a Leave leader, Michael Gove, um, as we've heard today, or Theresa May, the other front runner from the Conservative Party who was on the Remain side, um, uh, and uh, or, or whether or not a new a new sort of um, force comes to make the um, make the case for the European Union from from the Labour Party side. Um, so I think you know that 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 prospect of a general election um, gives gives some room for um, for a potential uh, change on the decision that was taken last week. Um, and then the second um, issue is that um, once our Article 50 is invoked. There is then a two-year period in which um, the terms of the UK's um, exit from the EU can be negotiated. During that two-year period, the negotiations can be stopped at any time from the British side. After that, uh, you're out on whatever um, terms you're left with. Um, so during that period, if a deal is reached, um, uh, and if it's not a deal on which the government at the time feels confident um, that they want uh, the UK to leave on, um, uh, then I think at that point it is possible that there may be another referendum on, on a more specific question to the UK, do you want to leave on these all terms? Right, all because right. that question wasn't answered with the last one. Now at that point, uh, we want to now look at a slightly different angle to the post post-Brexit uh, uh, vote, and there's been a significant rise in racist attacks in Britain since the result was announced. Police statistics have uh, reported that hate crime's gone up by something like 57% in the past week alone, and some of these incidents have found their way online. Now, here's a particular example which came from Manchester in the north of England. Now there you can see and hear a teenager on the tram yelling at another passenger. He's calling him an immigrant and he's telling him to get back to Africa. And then you can see him there throwing beer at the guy. And that's when the other passengers mobilise. They force him off the train. Well, um, so that was just one incident of an alarming rise of what's being described as xenophobia. Now, I'm just trying to, to find out from all of you what you think about this uh, upsurge of, of uh, quite often violent and racist behaviour in Britain. Starting with you, Mark, because uh, politicians have used what is uh, inherent racism or prejudice uh, in their populations uh, forever, haven't they, within, you know, to their own political ends. So is this a case of the, uh, the Leave campaigners having whipped up a bit of a frenzy and exploiting people's innermost prejudices? Yes, um, I think uh, that the undercurrent of, uh, of feeling and it's not perhaps a traditional feeling. The traditional feeling, regrettably, in Britain has been uh, a, a, a racial prejudice. This is more, I think, better described as just xenophobia, a, a dislike of foreigners. That feeling has always been present in Britain, but it has, I think, uh, increased over recent years 
because of the feeling that immigrants from, uh, from Europe were a threat to people's economic prospects. So you've got a, a, a growing feeling of uh, a resentment against incomers as, as they're seen, and this has been given an extra boost by the Brexit campaign. Obviously, Brexit campaigners, uh, generally speaking, kept away from that kind of uh, issue, but they did use rhetoric of the kind of, uh, we want our country back, and this, of course, was the kind of thing which could easily uh, trigger off feelings of resentment against uh, the immigrant population. And there was also a poster uh, published by the United Kingdom independence leader where Nigel Farage gave it his uh, endorsement. And that really did w uh, appeal, I think, to the mixture of feelings of resentments and racism which do exist in our country, regrettably. Now, the, the question is whether, in fact, the statistics which show an increase in these incidents, whether that is partly, at any rate, uh, a reflection of an, an increase in the reporting of these incidents. Suffice it to say that this is an element which is always here. It hasn't been helped at all by uh, the uh, Brexit campaign, the victory of the Brexit uh, side, and that the politicians are very aware of the dangers that might lie ahead as people who think that they were going to be liberated from the European Union on Thursday night now realise that it's going to be a very long process and that they're going to have to learn one way or another to live with people who've come over here for the perfectly legitimate reasons, they're not going to have mass deportations as perhaps people were hoping. And Sonny, uh, this has been described in some quarters as perhaps almost a failure of politics because uh, those who are expressing these kinds of uh, vile uh, sentiments against uh, various uh, foreign groups or minority groups within Britain, uh, they're generally the people who have been left behind. Globalisation has not been good to them. They've been left without jobs, without prospects, and they haven't that got the skills to compete in the modern world. These are the people that the politicians have ignored. That's been put forward as a, an explanation, if you like, as to why we're seeing this kind of behaviour. I think that's a very shallow explanation. There are a lot of people who are working class, who may not be well off, but are still not xenophobic or racist. And there are some people, a lot of people, in fact, middle class, well to do, and still can be quite racist and xenophobic. So it's not necessarily a class element or a globalization thing. I think what's happening here is that a lot of people who previously felt racist but did not want to say so in public now feel that the vote, a majority of the country agree with them. And they feel that the majority of the country voted to leave because they don't want immigration here. So as a result, they, can, they feel like it's perfectly OK for them to voice these opinions in public in a way that was looked down upon until very recently. And I think in the last few years, we've seen the growing kind of rhetoric, which has legitimized it. Um, and the gentleman, Mark, pointed out to Nigel Farage's poster, which was condemned by most mainstream politicians, you know, they feel that that kind of rhetoric is OK now. Um, and certainly the refugee crisis across Europe has not helped. But the point is, I, I think it's too simplistic to say, you know, these are people that the globalization left behind, and that's why they're now voicing their frustration. It's not necessarily true that the people who are racist are just, like, ignorant or poor or working class. I All think right. it can okay, be a well mixture. Let's, let's just... ask Susie. Let's ask Susie what she thinks. Susie, do you, who do you think is responsible, or is it, is it possible to attribute blame uh, for the climate in Britain in which people feel uh, the freedom to express these vile uh, attitudes and, 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 to, and to be violent towards people that they consider to be uh, immigrants, many of whom aren't, of course. Um, so who's responsible for having uh, allowed this climate to evolve? Um, I mean, I think, I think the blame is quite wide, and I think some of the key groups have been mentioned already. Um, it's not just the Leave campaign, but they're not without blame. It's not just the media um, uh, in terms of the, the, the way that um, they have talked about immigrants, um, the way that have, they have talked about um, Europe in the context of, of, of this campaign and others over, over the previous decades. Um, but, but that's part of it too. Um, and I think, uh, I think also um, part, of, part of the reason, you know, 
maybe part of it is to do with um, the fact that this was the referendum was in some ways an anti-establishment vote um, that was more about the sort of the effects of the austerity agenda um, on local communities and, and the impact that that's had on on public services and the concerns people have had about that but the people who've suffered from that are not exclusively uh, white uh, um, British people um, that it, it goes across um, all um, different ethnic groups um, uh, and 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 then secondly I think I think um, that uh, that, it, that what this shows in terms of the sense that um, people feel that the, the referendum vote is, has, has in some way legitimised uh, racism, xenophobia and, and this kind of hate speech that we've seen um, rise on the internet just shows the extent to which um, the Leave vote was a very um, diverse group um, and, 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 and people were voting for very different things, many of them very unrealistic um, in terms of what they thought Leave in the EU might actually achieve. Right. Uh, Sunny, because uh, further to Susie's point, I mean, the Leave campaign, not everyone uh, was racist, were they? And there were many black and Asian people who voted Leave the EU as well. Yeah, I mean, although the, we still don't know the full extent of how the vote was distributed, there were some polls showing that um, about 30 to 40 percent of ethnic minorities voted uh, to Leave, although I think that poll was a bit dubious because it had a very small sample size. I would suspect that most minorities, maybe about 25 to 30 percent, voted to leave. Um, but the point is that there was a lot of underground campaigning going on, which wasn't really necessarily caught up in the national uh, debate. So for example, I went to West London to look at what people were saying, and there were these banners everywhere saying that the European Union would destroy freedom of religion. Uh, and that there were senior judges who wanted to ban the hijab, ban the turban, uh, and ban Christian crosses, all this kind of stuff, which was untrue. But the point is that there was a lot of an underground campaign run by people to try and get uh, minorities to vote away. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that it's a very mixed picture out there. And I'm not saying that the vast majority of people who voted leave were racist. There's no, no doubt about that. But the point is there's a lot of people who did vote leave voted on the basis of immigration. Right, absolutely. And there is a absolutely. large percentage of people... Uh, absolutely. Can I give... And there's a large percentage of people who feel like that that legitimised their views, their Indeed. racist views. Indeed. Mark, I'll give you the final word because uh, from our conversation today and, and uh, everything that we've been observing since the vote, uh, Britain is most definitely a broken society, isn't it, right now, on, on, on so many different levels. Do you think that it is within the, the power of whoever occupies number 10 to fix it, to heal Britain? Well, the problem here is that it, uh, very much the case, as our discussion has uh, hinted, uh, that part of this at least was a, a sense of, of reaction against the establishment. It's, I'm afraid, members of that very establishment who are going to appeal for calm. I do think that, generally speaking, they'll get a very uh, good response because Britain, I think, attitudes have changed. However, the, there are pockets of, of areas where uh, those voices of liberal reason just aren't heeded at all. And I do think the, the danger is already being noted by politicians as the frustration may well grow with the feeling that things aren't being done to get Britain out of the EU. The Sun newspaper had a headline of Independence Day. This kind of thing, just, but nothing has happened. Uh, obviously, the process is going to take a long time. So I think that we're going to have to keep a very close eye on the situation and to try, I think, to assemble a coalition of people, not just the usual establishment voices, a coalition of people who uh, show their vehement opposition to this kind of thing because ultimately I think we can now say this kind of thing is anti-British uh, whereas perhaps there will be people saying that the, the, the British people should stand up for their own kind and that kind of racist talk it really tolerance has become part of Britishness and this needs to be emphasised urgently. Okay great thank you all very much thank you Mark, Sonny and Susie for a very interesting conversation at an interesting moment thank you. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime you like by going to the website, aljazeera.com. For more discussion, should you want, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can always join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story from me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha is bye for now.